Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, James O'Keefe. I'm a cardiologist from Kansas City. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about potential damage from excessive endurance, extreme cardiovascular exercise. So this is a topic that is very controversial. And I'm coming to you as a lifelong exercise aficionado. I love to exercise. I'm sort of a hyperactive kid. It's one of the reasons I went into cardiology in the first place. I really love exercise. It calms me down. And then when I'm in cardiology, I see all the problems that come up when people that don't exercise. So to us, to cardiologists, this is sacrilege. And I've gotten a lot of feedback. I mean, a lot of negative lashback. On, we've published two or three papers in the last uh, two or three months on this issue. And, and, uh, but, but the science is really coalescing and is telling a really interesting story that, um, that, that I think you'll find interesting. So let's go back to the beginning of the marathon. All right, Pheidippides was the first marathoner. He was a Greek herald messenger runner, and he uh, for a ran for a living. He didn't use a horse. He would run messages back and forth. He was about 40 years of age. There was a big you know, war going on, the Greco-Persian War, about 490 BC. And it had been a busy time. It was towards the end of the war, and things were getting intense. And he was run, running 150 miles, about 48 hours, the 48 hours before the day of the first marathon. And on the, first day, on the day of the first marathon, he got up, and he was a little sore, and he was a little tired, and, but you know, it's time to go to work. Well, it turns out that the Greeks beat the Persians that day in a, little, in a, in a, in a uh, battlefield outside of Marathon. And so he ran from Marathon back to Athens, which was about 26 miles. And when he got there, he said, victory is ours, and he collapsed and died. Not an auspicious debut for the marathon, right? People seem to forget that. Then they, they actually, it became a race in 1896 in the first modern uh, Olympiad. And they decided, well, let's do a long distance race and why not commemorate Pheidippides with the marathon? And so, and it's a strange place in America these days. In the last 30 years, um, while obesity has tripled, the number of people running a marathon has gone up 20 fold. Kind of like the old Dickens novel, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. We tend to a, a sort of, you know, embrace extremes in America. And, uh, and I, marathon running, you know, Hippocrates was one of the contemporaries of Pheidippides, uh, a few years younger. But I wonder if this was not uh, influenced him, that, that one of his quotes. He was the father of medicine, by the way, modern medicine. He says, the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too little, not too much, is the safest way to health. He figured this out 2,500 years ago. This is not rocket science. This is perfect common sense. You would know this if you've ever run a marathon. Have you ever run a marathon? Yeah, most people, yeah. So I ran a marathon when I was in medical school a long time ago, and I was miserable. My knee, and I was like 23 at the time. My no, knees were sore. I was sort of hypothermic and confused by the end of it. And I thought, you know, even though I loved exercise, I thought, this is not my favorite kind of exercise. I haven't went, run one since, and although I have, I have probably been exercising too much, as it turns out. I'll tell you about that later. But so there's been these, you know, rash of marathon deaths that have runners on edge. Um, and uh, it's interesting to notice that 50% of the deaths in a marathon, and, and I went back up to say, deaths in the marathon are not the big problem. That's sort of like the, you know, the tip of the iceberg. The bigger problem is this is not ideal for cardiovascular health or for longevity. This is kind of like the obvious catastrophe, but and by the way, 50% of the deaths of these long distance races like full distance triathlons or marathons paradoxically occur in the last mile, the last few minutes of the race. I haven't really figured out why that is, but it probably has something to do with cardiac fatigue and then a burst of uh, catecholamines, adrenaline towards the end, of, you know, and it triggers an arrhythmia. But in any event, um, one of my good friends, I've, <laughs> like a lot of my social network is composed of people who overexercise. <laughs> so, but anyway, one of them is, is a girl named Megan there in the middle, and she's like one of the, uh, she was like one of the top female triathletes in America last year, and you know, she's doing well this year too. But I've been, she's 30, and I've been telling um, Megan, well, last year, for example, she did like 10 real high level triathlons, mostly one full distance triathlon, and, and uh, mostly um, were um, Olympic distance about two hours of hammering it. 
So she won the female, overall female, in about six of them, and the other six she collapsed before the end of the race. You know, so they start testing her up, and you know, she can generate just ridiculously high hyperthermia temperatures. I mean, she's just basically, I told her, Megan, you know, we gotta, you gotta find a better outlet for your um, overachieving, you know, kind of nature. And she admits, and she, you know, she's, she's gonna quit this year. But in any event, um, anybody ever read Born to Run? This is like the Bible. I read this too. This is the Bible. And even when I read it, I thought, you know, this is glorifying ultra distance running. And it's not really accurate um, saying that we're born to run. In fact, we're born to walk. The latest science would suggest we're really born to walk. And running was meant to do on an intermittent, you know, chasing a monkey for a few hundred yards or running away from a tiger for a quarter of a mile or something. But under no circumstances would we be running 26 miles at a time. Uh, not, not in our in our Paleolithic ancestry. So um, the star of Born to Run is a guy named Micah True, Caballo Blanco, the mythic, epic runner who'd run a hundred miles in a day and in the Copper Canyons of Tara, with the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico. And um, so he died at the end of March this year. He was out on a little 12-mile training run, which is like a walk in the park for him, in sort of the, the backwoods of, um, in the mountains of uh, New Mexico. It took him four days to find his body. When they found it, they did an autopsy, and they, they said he died of idiopathic cardiomyopathy, which in cardiac language means a weak, thickened, stiff heart muscle, a diseased heart of unknown cause. But I looked at the pathology report, and in fact, his heart was a poster child for what we've dubbed Pheidippides cardiomyopathy, okay? His heart was enlarged, stiff, thick, especially the right ventricle and the, and the two atria. Stiff, thick, sort of like accelerated aging. His heart was irritable. He was out on a training run. He was 58 years of age. That's when this starts kicking in. You can get away with it when you're 15 or 20 or 25 or 30 or 35 or 40. Things start you know, happening around 40, 45. It's about when I started noticing palpitations and, and problems when I'd really hammer it. And in fact, I have a bunch of friends. One of my best friends is a cardiologist from down in um, New Orleans. And uh, he has been running 50 miles a week forever. Cardiologists are, tend to be, you know, exercise addicts. But, um, and these days when he goes out to do even a 5K or 10K run, he has to take flecainide, which is an antirhythm because it gets atrial fibrillation just before it starts it. Atrial fibrillation is ep epidemic among endurance athletes. A lot of them don't even know they're having it. It's a rapid, irregular heart rate that can, can predispose to, uh, to stroke. So, um, the, you know, there are signals out there and if, and if you, um, and that, that this might not be healthy. But in any, way, in any event, um, there's no doubt, and, and this is what I really want to uh, make sure you understand, is that Exercise is among the very most important things you can do for your health. Let's put that right out there right now. This is not an excuse to sit on the couch, okay? <laughs> this, you know, th this is fitness. This is like fitness level, better than 10 mets. If you can skip rope, you can do 10 mets. If you can jog at uh, six miles an hour, that's about 10 mets, okay? A 10 minute mile. If you can do that, that plateaus out. You, you have half the mortality over the next 20 years as somebody who can't do five mets, which is a, a pretty low level exercise. Having a hard time, you know, doing more than two flights of stairs without having to stop and, and, and catch your breath. So, uh, but the point is, uh, and we just wrote an article that was published in Lancet on this topic, but this was a, an article in the same uh, um, journal of a half a million Chinese, and this is physical activity for an hour, up to an hour. This is, this is the, the red line is moderate activity, light to moderate activity. Vigorous activity is here, and even vigorous is less than 10 mets. But you can see this is mortality reduction. You get the most benefit at about 40 to 50 minutes. And then there's a rather broad, uh, 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 sort of sudden plateau. And like a lot of things in life, there's a U-curve. This is an upside down U-curve, but it's the U-curve of life. We see it with alcohol. You see it with, um, with all sorts of things. And you see it with exercise. Okay. Mets is, so when you're sitting here, uh, still, you're, you're consuming about 1.5 mets. If you're sleeping, it's one met. If you're watching TV, it's one met. If you're thinking hard, hopefully like you are now, it's about 1.5 mets. So it's the, it's the resting metabolic rate. It's the energy you're burning to keep the lights on and the furnace running, okay? So um, 
a, a well-trained athlete can do 25 minutes, okay? Um, so the point is that the dose, like a lot of things, makes the poison. And exercise benefits, if we had a pill that was exercise in a pill, I'd be out of business. Exercise is so great for so many things. I mean, it, it, it will have, if you exercise for 30 to 45 minutes a day, sort of moderate to vigorous exercise, it'll cut your risk of dementia, early death, diabetes, heart disease, stroke in half, not to mention depression and improving quality of life in half. There's nothing else that gives you those kinds of benefits. But like any potent drug, too little is not enough. If you get up and just walk back and forth to the refrigerator from time to time, that's not going to do it. You need to get out and get like 20 minutes of exercise. Too much can be harmful. This is a potent drug. You go out and exercise for six or 10 hours a day, you're going to be in trouble. It might take a decade or two or three or four, but there's a lot of veteran extreme endurance athletes out there who are getting in trouble right now because we're just figuring this out. So the big thing to keep in mind is that there's a totally different thing between performance, peak performance and peak fitness and exercise for conferring longevity and overall health. And when you're an athlete, you think more is better, harder is better. You know, the, you know, the more fit I can get, the more I can, if I can go, if I can do a full distance triathlon, wow, then I know I'm really bulletproof. Wrong. That's the, that's the wrong pattern. So the truth is exercise conferred powerful benefits. The belief is more is better, but we now are coming to understand that exercise confers unique and potent benefits but you can overdo it. Believe me, you can overdo it. All right, so a really interesting study um, that, that I was part of and my best friend from down in New Orleans was uh, the lead author on this study, was very insightful in this regard. This is the U-shape curve we're talking about. And so they looked at 50,000 people in the Cooper Clinic and they followed them for up to 35 years, like 20 years of follow-up. And they found among the runners, they had a 19% lower risk of death than the non-runners. But among the runners, those who ran at moderate speeds, moderate distances, and moderate frequencies did the best. And so that means two to five times a week did better than people who just did once or seven times or six times. People who uh, ran at speeds around 10 minute miles did the best. That's a pretty slow jog. I mean. You know, if you're a runner, you're thinking, come on, this is a warm up, I need to get going. But this is like 20 years of follow up. This is pretty darned good data. And people who were um, the distances, what do, you think the be what do you think the best distance was? More is not better. It was like, how many, how many miles a week, you think? Not more than 20. Yeah, five to 20. You could run a mile and a half three times a week, and you would get, you'd be at the bottom of that U curve. It's amazing. And so when you run faster, longer, more often, you don't get more benefits. You get less benefits. And if you start running marathons, you start getting to look like the non-exercises with respect to your cardiovascular risk. So let's just talk a few minutes about what happens when you go out. When you're sitting here, we're talking about METs, your cardiac output is five liters a minute. When you go out and you're a trained athlete and you're hammering up a hill full speed or you're running, uh, you're running a marathon, you're, this is about a gallon a minute at rest. It's more like six times that. A trained athlete, Lance Armstrong, Miguel Enderain, you know, the, the best athletes in the world, will generate 35 to 40 liters a minute. This is massive cardiac output. And you can train up to do it, but after a, time, after a while, it takes its toll. And what happens is this volume starts stretching the heart out, and the, the myocardial cells start getting pulled apart. After a few hours and a few decades of doing this every day, it starts pulling the muscles apart and causing tears in the muscle. And you see troponin elevations in up to 50% of people after a marathon, even trained marathoners, half of them. A troponin is what I measure. If we come in and you're having a heart attack, we measure the troponin to see if there's been heart damage. It's a sine qua non. If you have a high troponin, you've had heart damage. Half marathoners have heart damage by the end of the race. And you can replicate this perfectly well in, in running at rats, running mice. You have to run them for like over an hour a day hard, really hard for about four months, and you'll see this scar tissue form, and it makes the heart. This is, these are MRI images. It's hard to see. But, um, but you get this scattered fibrosis in the right ventricle and the atria from this volume sort of stretching the heart, causing accelerated aging in the heart. Okay, So 
it's, you know, training goes like this. There's this big, you know, like a marathon or a full distance triathlon or a 100 mile bike ride through the mountains, really hard. The kind of thing where you're just, sh you're really shot, shot afterwards. You, it takes you days to recover, a really hard effort. So what happens, it's an acute reversible injury. Your troponins are up. We did echo on your heart. Your right ventricle wouldn't be contracting as well. Your atria would be a little bigger. By seven to 10 days, it's all back to normal if you've been recovering, okay? But when you do this, and, and then you get stronger, do these bouts when you're 20 or 30. But when you start to get middle age, what happens is you don't fully recover. And this next time, you don't recover. You, and before you know it, you have this overtrained, hypertrophied, stiff, accelerated aging heart. That's not what we're looking for when we're going trying to get in shape, right? We don't want a, we don't want an accelerated aging heart. And in fact, marathoners, chronic marathoners, after 25, these are people who've been marathoning for 25 years, at least at least uh, more than one marathon a year for 25 years. These are veteran endurance athletes. They had twice the coronary plaque in their coronary arteries as sedentary controls. It's not good. And there have been th three or four studies like this. Again, it's very controversial. So, uh, not only did they have more plaque, but they had m twice as many events as the sedentary people. Okay? Again, I'm not telling you to be sedentary. Remember, at the bottom of that curve is exercise. But you just have to be moderate about it. All right, atrial fibrillation, five-fold increase incidence, like in my best friend. I see it all the time. I can feel it myself, not atrial fibrillation, but I can feel my heart getting irritable if I overdo it, if I run, ride too hard, run too hard, if I don't allow myself to recover. Um, and, and AFib is a big stroke risk. So just to summarize what happens, strenuous exercise. And a lot of this is still evolving. So I'm not going to be able to really tack it down. And people say, well, how much and what kind? And, you know, we really don't know. Some of this is common sense. All right. But so high catechols, your adrenaline's high, your oxygen's die. You, you know, the volume is massive. You, you get some damage to the heart. It dilates up. It, you get cardiac fibrosis. It scars down. It gets rigid. It gets stiff. It gets enlarged. It gets accelerated atherosclerosis. All right, great book. Gretchen Reynolds, uh, she interviewed me for a New York Times article after this, um, the first of these articles came out in early June. Um, I was in the Amazon rainforest with my 12-year-old daughter and we were hiking and canoeing very moderately <laughs> in the rainforest. Uh, but it was kind of fun because we, we had, it was, there was no electricity around there. We found a link up to a satellite and we were talking to uh, the BBC World News and, and Gretchen, she, she published an article uh, in the New York Times about, and she has a book recently out about the first 20 minutes saying that exercise is better, trains uh, uh, smarter, live longer. And her point is the first 20 minutes you get most of the benefits, okay? Heck, 30 to 45 minutes you'll get full benefits from a cardiovascular standpoint. If you wanna, if you wanna do more than that, um, you know, you have to, uh, this is kind of a funny story, but, but rats, you can train rats, you know, if you give, uh, uh, I was talking to uh, somebody today who's telling me a story. Uh, he does research uh, on, on rodents, and um, they find that they can get rodents to get addicted to running on the, the wheel and the thing. And they, they, they actually set it out in the desert, and the mice actually would find it, and these even wild mice would come and get so that they would get addicted to running on, the, on, the, on the, the wheel out in the desert. But so I ask people all the time, they say, so like they come to me as a cardiologist, say, I want to do a marathon. I say, um, okay, you can do one and cross off your bucket list and find a healthier exercise pattern. And then I say, by the way, why are you doing marathons? Because if you're doing it for your health, this is not, it's like climbing Mount Everest. You do it once, you know, you have boasting rights, move on to something healthier. You're not going to climb Mount Everest once, you know, a week or something ridiculous like that thinking that it's good for you, okay? But there is the stress reduction and the addictive quality, and, and a lot of people, a lot of their social network is around exercise. But still, we need to you know, think about healthier uh, exercise patterns. Uh, we did a, an interview with Ambie Burfoot, and um, he said, well, what's this? This is like everything else. It's, all sorts of bad things can happen to you when you get out of bed in the morning. I said, well, you know, first of all, a lot of bad things can happen when you get out of bed, but they're nothing compared to things that, that happen to people that don't get out of bed, like they end in the hospital. So exercise is good, um, but just like our ancient ancestors did, they walked a lot, four to 10 miles a day. Walk everywhere, stand up, rather than sitting down, stand up more, take the stairs every chance you get. That's the kind of exercise we're meant to do. Do some high intensity interval training and be a hunter gatherer. In the, these are Frank Ferencich's slides, by the way. But um, so to summarize, um, to summarize, I would, and some of this is my intuition based on the research we've done and coalescing the data, but there's a lot more to learn 
admittedly. But I would say, if you're going to do strenuous exercise, which I heartily endorse and I do myself, try to limit it to about 45 minutes a day, up to an hour. Not more than seven hours a week of really hard, and especially if you're over 40, 40 or 50, because then you start getting in trouble. Um, try to spend as much time as you can during the day with moderate, light to moderate activities. If, uh, if you want to do a marathon or a full distance triathlon, cross, do it once and, and uh, you know, uh, move on to a healthier exercise pattern. And cross train. Swim, Pilates, yoga, weight training, very important. Fitness is multifaceted. If you're training for life, for longevity, for vigor, for mental capacity, marathons are not the way to do it. Two hour, four hour, six hour runs and rides are not the way to do it. Exercise for 30, 40 minutes with aerobics, then start doing stretching and strength training. Thanks for your attention. Mm -hmm.